All right, if you take your Bibles this morning, let's turn to John's Gospel, chapter number 13. John's Gospel, chapter number 13. Lord willing, we're going we're gonna to close chapter 13 out this, this morning. We're seeing Jesus, the night of His arrest here, as He uh, instituted the Lord's table, washed His disciples' feet, Judas has been given the sop. He has gone out to betray the Lord. And the Lord has some final words here to, to give to His disciples that are left, the eleven, as Judas has fled. Look at uh, John chapter number 14, I mean John chapter 13, excuse me, John 13 verse number 31. John 13, 31. It says, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify, glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. In other words, just, it was going to be very soon. Little children, Yet a little while I am with you. You seek me, you shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily I say, very verily I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. The central verses in what we just read here are verses 34 and 35, where Jesus gave his disciples here a new commandment just prior to going to the cross. But we need to understand that this is also uh, intended for every believer and by way of the Great Commission. Later on, the, the Lord will give His Great Commission to His disciples, and part of that commission is to the folks that they were disciple, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So this, this command to love our brothers and sisters in Christ as Christ loved us is applicable to us here today. Now, in what way was this command a new commandment? Well, remember that Jesus said that the entire Old Testament law is summed up by two commandments. The first one is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the second command, he said, uh, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, that's Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. And he said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So how is Jesus' command here new? Well, it actually elevates the love toward the brethren. It elevates our love toward the brethren to, for, to a whole new level. A whole new level. Before this command, our love toward our fellow believers would have fallen under the love for our neighbor rule and uh, we loving our neighbor as ourselves. But Jesus gives the command here, the new, newness of Jesus' command is in the new standard that he gave, as I have loved you. In other words, as brethren, we are to love each other as Christ has loved us. That's a tall order. Of course, Jesus' love for us is a sacrificial love that took him to the cross for which we're thankful for. Amen. Apart from the cross of, our, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, none of us could have salvation. Many times the word love here uh, um, is 
referred to by the Greek word agape or agapeo that it's translated from in many places. It's love here. It's charity in the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. But it's a love that seeks the highest good for another. That's the kind of love that we're talking about. A love that's not self-seeking at all. It seeks what's the highest good for the other person. Which when you are living in sinful flesh, oftentimes it's our selfishness rises to the top, doesn't it? We're, we're more concerned about what's in it for me. But loving one another as Christ loved us, I want us to understand this morning, it's impossible to live it out consistently apart from the power of God's Holy Spirit that He has given within us. But it is possible with the Holy Spirit's help. That phrase, as I have loved you, bumps Christ's command up to an impossible level for us apart from His love working in us and through us. It's His supernatural love that comes from His divine nature. You realize that when you got saved, when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, you got His divine nature within. You got His Holy Spirit within. Those things are given to us uh, to, to do the things that we could not do in our flesh. We can never attain that level of love walking just according to our flesh. It's the same level as Paul's command to husbands in Ephesians 5.25 when he says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. It's a tall order, isn't it? And so, I want you to listen close here. We never reach a point where we can say, well, I've got that one down. Let's move on to other things. It's a constant battle because we battle our flesh, don't we? The flesh wants to be selfish. This command of love is one that we've got to keep working on because the tendency of our flesh is to resist it. And so one of the keys to this command is to come to a greater understanding of Jesus' love for us. And, and our text here reveals five aspects of this love that I hope to be able to cover this morning. First of all, we see in verse 31 and 32, we see Jesus' love was a costly love. Now, look at uh, verse number 31 and 32 again. And Je Therefore, when he was gone out, speaking of Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Now, this statement takes us all the way back to John chapter number 12 and verse 23, where after hearing that some Greeks were seeking him, Jesus said, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And we saw when we were studying that that the text there uh, makes it clear that Jesus was referring to the time of his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what he was speaking of. On one level, the cross was the ultimate humiliation and shame. There's, there was no worse way to die than to be stripped naked, flogged, beaten up, and then nailed to a cross that you were forced to carry up, and then hung to suffer a, a slow and agonizing death as a public spectacle, all while you're being mocked. That's the kind of death that Jesus suffered. But in another way, the cross was the ultimate glory both for the Heavenly Father and His Son. To glorify God is to display and magnify His attributes. At the cross, we see God's love. I mentioned that in my prayer a while ago. You ever have a doubt about God's love, all you need to do is look at the cross. It shows the great love that God had for us as sinners. At the cross, God's love is it can be seen. God's righteousness can be seen. God's justice can be seen. His mercy and grace were magnified as never before in history. At the cross, God's justice was upheld as His sinlessly perfect Son bore the awful penalty that His justice 
demanded for all of our sin. But at the same time, God's love and grace were on display as God offered and still offers eternal life to all who re repent of their sin and trust in Jesus' provision alone. And if you haven't trusted in Jesus' provision for your salvation, I trust that you'll come and do that today when we get to the end of the message. In John 13, 32 there, Jesus referred to His resurrection and His ascension uh, that's when the glorification was going to take place. The, the resurrection was God's stamp of approval on Jesus' accomplishment by His death. Jesus' ascension into heaven exalted Him again to His heavenly Father's right hand. As, as Paul stated in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21, he said that Jesus was put up far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Jesus was exalted by His heavenly Father. And Paul stated it this way in Philippians chapter number 2 and verses 9 through 11. He said, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Him, and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow uh, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But the point is this. Jesus' love, as seen at the cross, was a costly love. A costly love. That theme is repeated over and over again in the Word of God. John 3.16 is the most familiar. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He sent His only begotten Son in the world to suffer that shameful death, that sacrificial death for us. So that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. 1 John 3.16 it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us. That's why I say well, anytime you want to doubt God's love for you, just look at the cross. Go to the cross. You'll see His love manifested. Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Not only did God the Father send His only begotten Son into the world, but Jesus willingly went to the cross on our behalf and suffered on our behalf. For Jesus to go to the cross was an act of supreme self-sacrifice, which He willingly endured on our behalf. But it was costly was costly. Secondly, I want us to see Jesus' love was a caring love. It was a caring love. Verse number 33. The term here, little children. It says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you. We see here Jesus' tender, caring love for His disciples expressed in two ways. First of all, He addresses His disciples as little children. Now this is the only time that this word is used in the Gospels. And we know it's used elsewhere in the epistle of 1 John where the Apostle John uses it seven times. It's a word of tender feelings. Tender feelings much as a father or mother has toward their little children who need their help and protection. Remember that time when you first held that bundle of joy and you wanted to protect them. You wanted the best for them. Um, you wanted to help them to mature into adulthood. Jesus explained to His disciples that He would be leaving them soon. The disciples would seek Jesus. In fact, we will see here later that uh, as they go, He's not in the tomb anymore. You know, after He's crucified, buried in the tomb, three days later, He's not there anymore. 
If they could have just remembered that he said he wasn't going to be there, but they were in one ear and out the other. Yeah, They weren't really listening a lot of times when Jesus was speaking to them. But they would seek Jesus. But the disciples would not be able to go with Jesus, at least not for now. Peter questioned the Lord about this in verse number 36. And Peter didn't like the answer, but Jesus knew what he was talking about, just as he always does. There in verse 36, uh, when, when Jesus said, uh, answered him, said, Whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter didn't like that. Now, in the next chapter, Jesus explains that they would go to where he was going later, but not at this time. The picture here, again, is of a caring parent explaining to his children that he has to go away for a while and they can't accompany him for now. We've all seen that in, uh, depicted in different ways in media. But the point is, Jesus' love was filled with tender feelings for his own disciples here. Paul's love for the Thessalonian church emulated the love of Jesus that we see here. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7 and 8. As Paul addresses the church there, he says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. See, Jesus was not without feeling. He knew what was going to happen when his disciples uh, when, uh, were looking for him and he's, he's no longer there. I mean, they, think about it. They've kind of been dependent upon him for three years, walking around with him, been used to being with Jesus. Well, now they're going to get used to Jesus not being there, but Jesus being in here. <laughs> the Holy Spirit of, of the Lord Jesus Christ being within their hearts and lives. So Jesus' love was a costly love. Jesus' love was a caring love. Thirdly, Jesus' love was a commanded love. There in verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Jesus' love was a commanded love. Listen, in, in going to the cross, Jesus was obeying the Father's commandment. He says as much in John chapter number 10, verse 18. But here Jesus commanded His followers to love one another even as He has loved us. Now, the fact that Jesus commands us to love one another as believers means that we can do it. You know, a lot of people say, well, I just can't do that. I'm just, I'm just not built that way. If you've got God's divine nature within you and you've got God's Holy Spirit within you, it's possible as you yield to the Spirit. Understand that there are no accept acceptable excuses if we fail as believers to love other believers. None of us can do it in our own strength, of course. We know that love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? In fact, it's the very first one mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and other things that are there. Love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit that He produces in us when we walk in dependence on the Holy Spirit and His power. Now see, that's... That's the rub right there. Too often we are walking in the power of our own flesh rather than working, walking around in the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. <coughs> Just as Jesus obediently sacrificed Himself to go to the cross for our salvation, so we are to obediently sacrifice ourselves for the ultimate good of our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we as brothers and sisters in Christ don't love our brothers and sisters in Christ in the way that Christ loved us, 
what are we being? We're being disobedient children. That's what we're being. Jesus' love was not a feeling, by the way. He's not talking about having feelings for somebody. He's talking about our actions toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus' love was not a feeling, but an action of obedience to His Heavenly Father. So we should not look to have feelings of love before we show love by our actions. Let me ask this. Would you have wanted Jesus to follow His feelings as a person? Or are you glad He was obedient to His Heavenly Father? I'm glad He was obedient. So Jesus' love was a costly love. It's a caring love. It's a commanded love. And there in verse 35, we see that Jesus' love is a conspicuous love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now, Jesus was not talking about just having nice thoughts toward others. You know? No one else can see that going on, can they? That you've got nice thoughts about somebody. He was talking about having genuine love from our heart that manifests itself in our actions that others can see. And not that we are trying to do it to be seen. Okay, That's not the point. Right. It's the sort of love that stands out conspicuously in this self-centered world. This world, was, they ought to be able to see the way that believers love one another and, and say about us, you know, they must be followers of Jesus. You know, I, I can see they got the characteristics of Jesus in their life. Sadly, many churches are known more for their infighting and divisions than they are for their love. And Jesus wants us to, to be known to others by the love that we have one toward another as brothers and sisters in Christ. A church family can sometimes have great diversity in it. That's not a bad thing. Think about just the diversity among Jesus' disciples. Luke chapter number 6 verse 15 records Jesus as having chosen Simon called Zelotes. Not Simon Peter, but the other Simon. The one we don't know very much about. We don't have any words that he spoke. We don't know a whole lot about him, but his name reveals to us some important aspects of Simon Zelotes. Because Zelotes means the, the zealot. He's one of those obscure apostles. Um, there were several of them. But the zealots were a radical political group that used intrigue, violence, force, and deception to try to achieve its goal of liberating the Jews from Roman rule. In our day and time, we might say they were the patriotic Jews. They were about country. You know, the... the the Jews were having to live under the thumb of Rome. You know, they didn't like that. Especially the zealots. And they tried to fight it with a physical battle. Many of them refused to pay taxes to Rome. And this group was known for attacking and sometimes even murdering government officials, especially the hated tax collectors. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Who else was the disciple? Matthew. Or Levi, who was a tax collector. <laughs> you think there might have been a little friction there? As we know, Jesus chose Matthew and Levi just as He chose uh, Simon Zelotes. The tax collectors were hated because they were viewed by their countrymen as having sold their souls to Rome. They didn't look at them as even being real Jews. They were Jews who sold out to the enemy. And they were known for collecting unjust amounts from the Jewish people to, in order to line their own pockets. They would become rich by doing that. You could not have put two men of more diverse backgrounds into the same group if you tried. And these were just two of the men that Jesus was telling to love one another. That kind of love would be conspicuous, don't you think? would be. 
But don't think for one minute that there wasn't diversity among the fishermen, the group of fishermen that Jesus called to. I mean, let's think about it. None of us are the same, right? We all have our little idiosyncrasies, if you want to call them that. And uh, I'm sure it was the same way with even the fishermen, that uh, they, they had the same passion about fish, uh, but they were much different in their personal lives. We are all individuals with our likes and dislikes, and sometimes even with prejudices, even though they ought not to be there that we grew up with. We have our own idiosyncrasies, as I said, and the more differences there are between us and others, the more difficult it can be sometimes for us to love as we are called to do. You find some people hard to love? We all do at times. And the churches in the Acts of the Apostles uh, and in the Epistles, you had the Jews and the Gentiles. Think about diverse but they were in one body. That's what Jesus did. Brought Jew and Gentile together in one body. Talk about a recipe for problems. Love for those who may be different from us has never been easy, but we are called to love them anyway. So Jesus' love was costly, it was caring, it was commanded, it was conspicuous, and lastly, Jesus' love was a committed love. There in verses 36 through 38, you know, I've, I've preached other messages that have focused on Peter's failure and subsequent restoration by the Lord. So I'm not going to focus on that this morning. There are many lessons that can be gleaned from that story. But just understand that while Peter thought that he was fully committed to Jesus, and in many ways he was. But his failure stemmed from not recognizing his own weaknesses. That's usually where we get in trouble at, isn't it? His trusting in his own loyalty rather than in the Lord set him up for his failure. So let's not focus on Peter's commitment to Jesus, but what I want us to focus on is the other. Jesus' commitment to Peter. Think about that. And Jesus' commitment to the other ten disciples in spite of their failure. Now we look at Peter's failure where he denied the Lord, but they all failed the test here at the end. Jesus knew that Peter would follow him afar off and would deny him, and he predicts it here. He also knew that all the disciples would forsake him and flee for their lives when he would be arrested later that night in spite of their protests to the contrary. Well, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go all the way with you. You don't have to worry about that. They were hard to find after the arrest of Jesus. Matthew 26 is where you read about that. But Jesus didn't cast them off for their failures, did he? He loved them to the end. We saw that in John chapter 13, verse 1. He loved them to the end, meaning He loved them to the conclusion. And He showed that, that love by restoring them and using them after His resurrection. Yes, they failed Him, but He came right back to them and said, Look, this is what I want you to do. This is what you're called to do. Love means being committed to the other person's highest good. And the highest good for every believer is that they would become more like Jesus. Right? I should be trying to help you to become more like Jesus. We should be trying to help each other become more like Jesus. That, that's the highest good. How do we do that? Well, we, we grow in holiness. And we grow in our living to glorify Him. We are to exhort one another. Amen. Sometimes we are to rebuke, rebuke one another in love. If we are all committed to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, then that should cause us to be able to work through any conflicts that arise uh, as we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, as Ephesians 4 verse 3 tells us. 
So this love that Christ calls us to have in here in the midst of His church is a self-sacrificing, caring commitment in which in obedience to Christ and the help of His Holy Spirit shows itself in the seeking the highest good of each other as believers. So that the world can look at us and say, you know, there's something different about that crowd down at Central Baptist. I can see Jesus in them. Now listen, this kind of love is the ideal. I realize that. And we live in a sinful world that presents us with many difficult situations that require prayerful wisdom, right? For us to be able to obey Jesus' commands. Does loving someone require that I like that person? It doesn't, does it? You can love someone with your actions without ever liking them. Does it mean that I must become a close friend with a difficult person? That's not what Jesus called us to do. He just called us to respond to one another in love. Since biblical love seeks the highest good for the other person, namely that he becomes more like Christ, you know sometimes it requires tough love. You ever heard the term tough love? Confronting a person with their sin is tough love. Letting them experience the consequences of their sin when they refuse to return to the Lord, they need to learn that. So they'll begin to hate that sin in their life and return to the Lord. Biblical love does not enable a person to continue in sinful or irresponsible ways. That's, that's not what we're to do. You know, it's not, well, you do your thing and I'll do mine and we'll just uh, just do each other's thing. And, uh, we, and by that we're loving one another. No, that's not it. <laughs> love tries to help a person learn to be obedient to God and be responsible to bear his own burden. So this morning, how's your love for your brother and sister in Christ? mentioned a while ago that if you don't know the Lord come to Him today receive His salvation He loved you and He still loves you He wants you to come He wants you in heaven with Him but the only way that you can go to heaven is by repenting of your sin and trusting in what He did on the cross of Calvary for us that know Him we need to Look in the mirror of God's Word and say, how is my love? Let me recommend that you do something. Go read 1 Corinthians 13. It talks about charity. That's the same word love that is here in John 13, 34 and 35. Same word. You see the qualities of love there. And ask yourself, how is my love? Ask the Lord, Lord, help me be real about how my love is. Amen. Let's love one another as Christ has loved us. Let's pray. Father.